Okay, let us begin our uh, seminar. I'm happy to meet everybody on our first seminar of this academic year. And today it's my great pleasure to introduce you Professor Antonio Sokin, who recently joined High School of Economics, uh, who did his uh, postdoc in, in uh, Inuria in Paris with uh, Francis Bach, with uh, Simone Lacoste Julien, right, and uh, with uh, Ivan Laptev. So now he's a professor in High School of Economics. And in today's talk, uh, Antonio will tell us about uh, his recently accepted paper to NIPS. And uh, this paper has got oral presentation. So just uh, uh, to know, uh, orals are less than 1% of total number of submissions to NIPS. So there was about uh, 3,200 submissions and only 40 papers uh, have got orals. And so this is one of uh, those 40 papers. So, uh, I'm quite curious to hear uh, what should you do to get uh, NIPS oral? Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, okay, so this is the, like, like, about structure prediction and about theory of structure prediction. So, mm, I'm not sure I will explain like what should you do to get NIPS oral, because this is kind of random, but like... Uh, <laughs> And also, like, what I'm not going to do, like, since there is like theory in the title, you might have guessed that there, is, there are proofs inside, but I'm not going to tell you any proof. So basically, my goal is to explain to you what is done it, like, what is done and why it is done, and like, uh, not how it is done. How it is done, like, there will be like, like some tricky moments which are like uh, below below the curtain. But for that, you, like, for those, I address you not even to the paper, but to supplementary, which is like uh, 20 pages after the paper. So you don't know it by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Okay, so like it's at some point I did know that when I wrote that. So and then I, I keep forgetting. So like every time I forget. Okay, so basically the plan it will be the following. First, I'll, like I'll go like uh, word by word. So first, I explain what structure prediction is, just like uh, for those of you who are young enough not to know. Then I'll explain what I mean by theory of structure prediction. And then we'll do like a calibrated uh, surrogate and so on. Okay, so let's start. So basically, uh, what is structured prediction? Structured, pr structured prediction is like umbrella term, like which is like a subset of which unites a sub subset of tasks of machine learning. So these tasks often like usually require to predict uh, many things at the same time. So basically, there are many variables that have to be predicted. So this is very related to graphical models, but graphical models have to be like probabilistic. They have to be like some like graphical model. And structured predict I, I like to think of structured prediction as something more general. It's like not it includes graphical models, but it's not limited to them. So like methods can be like not probabilistic at all. They just like uh, have to produce structured outputs. So basically, examples of data that is like structured like that include like sequences, tables, images, and so on. So now, like uh, two examples of the tasks that like a uh, classical task for structured prediction. So the first one is image segmentation. So probably like many of you have heard of this. So here, like input data is an image, and the task is to predict an, a label for each pixel. So clearly, like this, these labels have to be like connected with each other, and like neighboring pixels have pro probably have similar labels. <coughs> That's why like modeling this structure, modeling these connections, is very important. Another example is like handwriting recognition. So let's say we have um, <coughs> images of letters and we have to recognize what the word actually is. So he here also like sometimes sometimes people write in such a way that recognizing individual letters is impossible. So basically we need to kind of use context to, uh, to understand. And this helps a lot. Okay. So in structured prediction, usually there are like two very distinctive parts. At least like when people write papers on structured prediction, usually it's either inference or learning. Like, uh, it's so basically, I'll explain what these like, tasks are, because they will pop up always. Like, uh, they, they always pop up when, when someone talks about structured prediction. So first, inference. So basically, inference is basically prediction. So we are given input data, and we are given already the model, whatever the model is. And the task is to combine data and model to produce output. 
So this can be formed. This can be formed as probabilistic inference. This can be like combinatorial optimization, and something like graph cuts or like some more complicated methods. But the the task is to produce outputs. It doesn't have also it doesn't have to be like one single output. It could be distribution and outputs. But uh, I guess for now it doesn't really matter. So the second component is learning. So in learning, we are given a data set, like uh, usually labeled data set. So there is in, in, for each item there is input data and there are output labels. And the task is to uh, process all of that and produce a model that can later be used to predict. Okay. So basically, like in structured prediction, like when people talk about structured prediction, usually that's what they want. They want something that works. But and in the recent years, this approach has like dominated a lot, and usually like people concentrate uh, only on that. But sometimes this has limits, so there is no understanding why something works and what to do, like to make it work better. So we, we want not only that, we also like it's natural to ask guarantees. So like to ask something where we can provide guarantees on the on the results. So in in the, in, in this work, we are focusing like exactly on guarantees. So basically, like what kind of guarantees they mean? Like what, what like what kind of guarantees would we want? For example, like the, like the most what I think would be like the, the best guarantee ever is like if, if if you tell me like what accuracy you want, say like an expectation of with high probability, and I tell you how many iterations you need to like to achieve this. Then you have your method, you just run it that long, and then you get your guarantees. Are you speaking about learning method or about, yeah, about learning? Yeah, about learning. So here here this is mostly about learning, and like. I will kind of put inference aspect under the hood, but like, uh, if you don't understand how inference can be plugged there, you just ask me like when when, when it's appropriate. <coughs> okay, so basically, but like of course, like to achieve this, we are going to kind of uh, forget like the first part. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you from the beginning that this talk is not going to be practical. So uh, like uh, this paper is the first paper ever that I submitted without any single experiment. So basically, uh, this is this is left as a future work, and it's, it's, it's still it's still in this stage. So this is a secret to get oral on NIPs, yeah. Yeah, actually, 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 actually like I, I, like like for this particular project, I don't have like direct comparison, but like one of my collaborators at Inria, and that at more than that, that was computer vision conference. So like first, like uh, with the first submission, he he has some theory and he did some toy experiments to illustrate the theory, and he got rejected. And so like he, like uh, all the reviewers, like no one understood his theory. They were complaining about experiments. So he, what he did, he just cut off experiments, <laughs> and he said it is a theoretical paper. Smart. No one, no one will cri would criticize your experiments if you don't have any. Yeah, that actually worked. <laughs> I think he got like a spotlight or something, so he, he got in for sure. One like, hundred percent reproducible work. <laughs> yes, like it's all there. Like uh, there, there is nothing more than the paper. It's all written. Okay, so let's go. So basically, like when we talk about guarantees, like usually, like the first thing that comes to mind, especially in this audience, probably will be like likelihood-based methods, like uh, conditional likelihood and something like that. So basically, let's introduce some notation. Like uh, I'll try to be consistent, but I'm not super sure. But like uh, I'll try to keep track of everything. So basically, let's say that we have input x, we have output y, and we have a loss l, and we are, we are going to use this loss to measure accuracy of the prediction at the test time. So and like, you, like in structured prediction, typically set of all possible y, or all possible output is exponential, and that's what make it, make this like structured prediction different from other tasks. So basically, like uh, one approach to train is to maximize conditional likelihood. Basically, log probability of uh, y given x, and like with respect to model parameters theta. So if, if we have a model like this, if we already obtain max the maximum, then like to predict, we need to minimize the we need to pick a label that minimizes the expected loss, uh, expected error. So if if we if our model is correct, if at this stage we manage to get the the model that is correct. This will give an optimal prediction, the optimal prediction. Okay, so like, what are the problems with this approach? Like, first, it's like we can never solve this exactly, and sometimes like solution doesn't exist, so, like or like it does exist, but it, uh, mm, it it doesn't correspond to the real model, and that's usually the case. 
And it, it, like if there is an error here, it's very hard to connect it with the error here. So that the type of guarantee that I wanted like in the beginning, like a guarantee on the prediction, like expected prediction error, is, is very hard to obtain. Basically, like I just don't know how to do it. So basically, and also like uh, what I see as a drawback of this approach is that this thing doesn't care about the, the loss. So it just loss, there's no place for the loss. So loss, and so the training is, is the same for all types of different losses. Although like some losses might be easy, some losses might be hard, and like there is no, it's not, it's, but training doesn't care. And also, like what I want to say that like, like to, to be able to work well for all possible losses, we have to get the distribution correctly. And getting the whole distribution correctly is, is, is hard. It's like not an easy task. Okay, so basically that's why like we haven't gone. We didn't go this way. So instead, like we we will go to something which is like frequentist, which is goes like more, but the which is goes together with the learning theory often, and like which is easier to analyze. And there are some of the drawbacks that I've mentioned, and just not present in this approach. So basically here the notation is again the same. And basically what we want, we want to minimize the population risk. So basically we want to minimize the prediction error directly. So here like uh, my, my model, like I'm in, in, introducing the first assumption that the model is parameterized with the score function. So basically there is a function f that takes the input and produces a score for each possible label. So usually like these scores are maximized. So if you are familiar with graphical models, this is like negative energy. So energies are usually minimized and scores are maximized. So here it's more convenient to work with scores. That's why we'll be always maximizing the score. So basically, again, like here, like this function is usually like very hard to minimize. It's like uh, cos non-convex, non-differentiable, and worse than that, it's piecewise constant. So there is no gradient. So it's, it's kind of uh, very hard to, to do anything. Piecewise constant because of the R max inside. So basically, what what usually is done, instead of minimizing this, like we take something else, which is minimized. It's, like, it, this is the usually called population risk, and this is surrogate risk. So basically, instead of the real loss, there is a surrogate loss. So basically, like, like to give you an example to connect with you with uh, what you should know, like one example of surrogate loss is like a structured SVM loss. Another one, so basically to recover the conditional likelihood method, uh, maximum likelihood method, maximum conditional likelihood method, we can do like uh, this kind of log loss. Okay. So basically, like in this formulation, like where is the structure? So the structure actually appears in two places. First place, that the loss is structured. So what do I mean by structured losses? Like for example, like hanging loss is structured. Like block zero, like, uh, like as a counterpart, like the, the, the most unstructured loss is zero one loss. When you say like, give a penalty of 1 if you predict incorrectly and give a penalty of 0 if you predict correctly. Another loss that like we are, I'm going to work with is a block 0 and loss. Basically, it's like all the labels are split in blocks and within, if, you, if you make an error within a block, you don't make an error. Uh, the cost is 0. If you predict a label from a different block, uh, Error is one. So this is also like like superstructure. And then having this uh, having loss is simply a particular case of block zero one loss. No, it's not. No? Like it's different one, but it so basically having loss like first it has like more assumptions. It it, it assumes that there are that the labeling consists of pieces, say like pieces like uh, multiple binary variables, and then you count how how many errors you make in these binary variables, and it's not the same. So basically, like the, the block zero and loss take value, it's either zero or one always, and having loss like it can be like zero, like uh, one third, like two thirds, and one, like if you have like three variables. Mm, I would say zero, one, two, or three. Zero, one, okay, but I, I always normalize to zero, one. Yes. Excuse me, what is R max? R max over uh, which variable? Over scores. So basically, f takes x as input and returns a, ve a vector. Like a uh, dimensionality of this vector corresponds to the number of y's. That's a huge vector, and then our mass is like uh, with respect to the indices of this. So basically, we can look at this as y. It can be can be the index of f, and then just picking the maximal element. Okay. Okay. So this is the first place where the structure is. That's the loss, 
And the second place is uh, the scores. So in the world of graphical models, usually like scores are assumed to be factorized. So basically scores are represented as a sum of certain things, and these things, like potentials, they depend only on a subset of uh, variables, not on all of them. So basically, that's why like, usually like, I will assume that set of allowed score vectors is constrained and belongs to something. So it's like not all the scores are possible. So we'll go further, like, uh, we'll further speak about these constraints. Okay, so basically, like when we like look at this setup, what are the issues that we have to deal with to be able to like show something? What are the problems? Like first, like we are minimizing not we we are solving this optimization problem, but we want to solve this. So this like there is like like a mismatch between the two functions, between the two um, objectives, and this has to be like dealt with explicitly. And actually, like about. About this, I will be like talking most of the remaining talk, most of the time. So basically, then the second problem is that there is like a, it's a, we are always working with a finite data set. There is no such thing as infinity in practice. So basically, like also something has to be done to take to take care of that. And second, like there is always optimization accuracy. So basically, optimization errors. So normally, like we cannot solve this exactly. So there will be like some optimization error there. So basically, in the like, theoretical setup that I'm going to tell you next about, I will talk like I will take care about all of that. So, so basically, I will be able to give you exactly the answer to the question I put in the beginning. So basically, what is the number of iterations to get the this test error like in expectation, like the, the real test error? Well, I will be always dealing with the expectation, but. It can be modified to high probability bounds, but I haven't done that. Okay, so what will be what's roughly the approach to to address these issues? So usually, in, in the literature, like this kind of stuff, this kind of problems, issues are addressed with with consistency. So this is like a, like a keyword for that. So consistency basically means that minimization of this, like uh, in the limit of infinite data, leads to minimization of this. So th this uh, this property is very well understood for binary classification. It's like a kind of closed. Uh, like the next slide, I'll tell you like what are the like what is the situation for binary classification. It's kind of studied for multi-class classification, like with multiple labels. Like there are some results there, but like no one has ever looked at this like in details for structured prediction. Okay, and so basically like uh, like. For this one, actually, like the, the standard, like the, the field that deals with it is uh, learning theory, and like for this one, usually there, there are like, like a, a lot about optimization methods. But like to kind of simplify the approach, because most of my focus is here, I, like here I want to use the simplest approach possible. So I will be using like online SGD, so which which deals together with both with uh, finite data samples and like uh, optimization accuracy. So like I assume that I do like only one pass of the data set. And so that uh, empirical risk is unbiased estimate for the average risk if you're making just one pass of this data. Yes. Uh, well, I, 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 I wouldn't say this uh, because like you, you're modifying your estimator like like on the way, so basically, but you're not. You can assume kind of you assume that like each time you draw a sample like to do your step of SGD, you like you, you get like fresh samples always. And. And that's why, and you can get up that only regret bound if you use online SGD. Only yes, but that that's 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 what I want. So basically, I want to bound like how how far, how far I am from the optimum. That's that's regret bound. Okay, so we'll go like we'll get to like like more specific like formulations. What I, what I what could be there. Okay, so basically, like, uh, let's go back to consistency. Like, like first, like a uh, binary classification. So in binary classification, uh, output basically is binary. There are two possible values. Usually, it's minus one and one, and the loss is zero and loss. So basically, it's just zero if there is a mesh between the prediction and the correct label, and one if there is a mismatch. So again, then the population risk is usually written in this form. And like this is like the zero the, the 
surrogate risk. And the, the key quantity becomes the, basically the product of the label and the score. So there is just one score. So basically, like uh, this theorem like of Bartlett et al. from 2006, but okay, sorry for the colors. Oh. It's just because of the theorem. No, it's like <laughs> it's not supposed to be like that. It was not supposed to <laughs> turn off uh, at the first theorem I started talking about. <laughs> Slowly like switch into the sleep mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, basically, okay, let's focus. So basically, but th this like result goes back, credit goes not only to these people, but to many people around, because this was a hot topic back then, and many authors like did stuff. This is like, uh, like just one, particu one particularly famous paper. So basically, what the result says that if the surrogate is convex, well, we usually want convex surrogates because we want to be able to minimize with guarantees. So then, it ha if it is differentiable at zero and if the derivative at zero is uh, less than zero, it's negative, then uh, this surrogate is classification calibrated, and that's the, the notion of consistency. So basically, it means that minimization of this in the limit of infinite data will lead to minimization of this, like, uh, like under this constraint. <coughs> So basically, what are the examples of the surrogates that satisfy this constraint? Basically, like all methods for the, mostly all methods for binary classification that you know, it's like, like it can be like exponential loss, it's hinge loss leading to SVMs, it's logistic loss leading to logistic reg regression, like truncated quadratic loss, like uh, all of them are like that. Uh, so again, you said that um, F is classification calibrated, and that imply that means that. Uh, in the limit, optimizing the surrogate loss will be will lead to yeah. uh, optimize in the real loss, the population risk. Uh, but are there there are many different functions? Is there a way to uh, quantify which one is is better in terms of uh, rate of convergence, for the example? Mm. So basically, like uh, that usually like like. These papers never touched this issue, they, they, they didn't care, basically. Uh, so, so basically, this, this goes to like the, the second, mm, the, 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 the second and the, the third options, like what's like the optimization accuracy. So basically, like the, the, the standard approach is that just you take uh, like uh, any like online SDG method, the risk convergence rate for, the, for, the, for, for that usually, then like it can register rate depend on certain constants. Then this constants will depend on your loss and some properties of your data. And then like uh, you just compute that constants and like uh, you're happy like if you can compute that. Yes. Uh, what is the function on plus big F? Yeah. Like like in, in the like in the, the default like st st uh, standard way it's just all mm, all measurable functions. Then, like, like those can be uh, approximated with universal kernels. So you, you like, like uh, with that. So and basically, beyond that, like, notion of, of consistency is not really applicable because it's hard to like, kind of. So, so basically, it, it's hard to push more compli complicated dependencies between the, the scores and the um, input, like through the like the, the theory. Just something things break. So basically, the, 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 I have to admit that there are people who, who try to do that, like uh, Igor Steinwart, like uh, Tong Zhang, if you know these names. Uh, but like, uh, to say the truth, I wasn't able to understand those papers. So like, I, I don't know. So, but they claim that there is some progress, but usually it's not really like used. And so what is the statement of the theorem? Is it that um, the minimum of uh, the first function equals the minimum of the second function. No. So basically, if you ha if you are at a minimum of this this of the surrogate risk, then you are at the minimum of this one. Okay. There's an implication. Okay. So basically, like uh, there is not nothing said about the uniqueness of those minimums and like. Uh, okay. So basically, like. Uh, what do, what do people do when we usually when, when they go to multi multi class case? So here, like there is like a very important notion of calibration function. So 
what is calibration function? So basically, the calibration function tells you what is, what is the minimum possible excess of the surrogate loss, of the expected surrogate loss, given that the excess of the expected real loss is big enough. So basically here, like, epsilon is the parameter. It's like how big is the excess of the real loss. And then, like, uh, this quantity shows the excess of the surrogate loss. So I've written the exact definitions here, but, like, I'm not sure if it's like super useful to parse them for you to parse them now, but th this is like the, the, the key intuition is that it says like how big the excess can like how big the, sur the expected surrogate loss can be from its minimum if there if the excess of the real loss is big enough. And what is what Q? Is Q? Yeah. <laughs> Q, Q? Okay, Q like this is simplex, so Q is probabilities, so those are like a kind of Posterior for posterior probabilities. Probabilities of what? Of labeling. So ah, this this is like a, a vector like of length like of dimensionality equal to number number of labels, and then it's like uh, those are like greater uh, those numbers are non negative and sum to one. They could correspond to some probability distribution over over labels. So basically, this 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 type of analysis is called like pointwise analysis. So basically, we assume that there is only one data point. And then it's like a worst case analysis. So what's the worst case distribution and worst worst case scores uh, such that the, the this will, will be true? And basically, yeah. Of, co of course, like there have been like at least several papers that criticize this kind of analysis and like claim that it doesn't capture the reality. Yes, that's true. But like there is not really they don't really offer something else. So it's, 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 it's hard. It's, this is already getting hard enough, but like got, going beyond is even harder. That would be like super interesting, but I think that's like a task for real statisticians, for people who like <laughs> can go for that. It's definitely not us. And not me, <laughs> that's for sure. Like while doing this, I have understood that I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> it's uh, kind of hard. Okay, let's go like to some examples to give you like uh, what this like a uh, calibration function looks like. Basically, consider like the Hamming loss. Like, uh, like the, so basically, there are two losses. Like this is like for Hamming loss, and this is for mixed uh, block zero one and zero one losses. Like I mean, basically, mixture with a mixing parameter of I think point two. So basically, what this shows. Uh, basically, this is epsilon, and this is like h of epsilon. So basically, red lines correspond to situations where f is the full space. The like curly F is the full space, so basically there are no constraints on this course. And blue uh, line lines corresponds to tight constraints on the on the loss Which on this course. So basically, like here, so be, like this, this is for the for the quadratic surrogate that I'm going to introduce like uh, on the next slides. But here, like uh, basically, this is the span of the loss matrix, like in this case or a span of the loss matrix of the Hamming loss, it's like super low rank. And then, like here, this is the span of the block zero and loss, which, you, which is also like super low rank. So basically, what I want to show you, that these functions are always non-decreasing, they go up. So basically, they can be non-continuous. Non non uh, they can be super nice, like quadratic uh, function, like this. So basically, what is important, so basically, these functions can completely characterize consistency. So basically, if uh, this function is greater than zero everywhere rather than zero, then like uh, situation is consistent. Mm. So there is like a, a result like from this guy, like uh, Tang 2004, like saying that. So basically, these functions are consistent, but we can see that they can be like very different. Like uh, speed of like, kind of speed of convergence can be vary a lot. And here, like this, like blue situation is not consistent, and this like is consistent. But again, like th this, this plot illustrates that sometimes inconsistent functions can work better because uh, they can just converge faster to somewhere. Uh, uh, once again, why the blue curve is not not consistent in the second case? Because it's zero. Because it's zero, like uh, up to point two. And what? And it's good. That can be no, it's not. By John. You know, no, no, so basically, look, like we, we can look, just look at this function. So basically, let's say uh, 
like say like, like look at this curve and like uh, epsilon point one, so it's equal equal to zero. So basically, it means that what does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so basically, it means that there exists F, like a uh, zero here, such that the excess of the loss is at least like point 0.1. So that there exists F and Q such that like this equals zero, mm -hmm. and like this is big. Mm -hmm. Isn't monotonicity is, is not our goal? We just want to... Yeah, my, like, this, is, this, is, this is monotone by default, by, by definition. So this is like always monotone. Because like because when we're in no, no, I mean the correspondence between two delta phi and delta L. If you decrease delta L a bit, you definitely decrease delta phi. Oh, it, it can stay the same. <coughs> but it's not always the case. Yes. So basically, no, like uh, when like like. It seems that 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 is our real goal. Mm, yes, you're right. So actually, like this kind of monotonicity. It implies consistency, so, but this is stronger than consistency. So usually, like when people talk about consistency, they don't like ask monotonicity. But this one is just stronger. Because, for example, okay, so like I think like when it like this function is stri strictly increasing everywhere, it is monotone. But like this transfer, like this calibration function can go like this. It like it doesn't have to be convex. So so basically, then it's not uh, it, there is no this monotone dependency, but like situation is still consistent and everyone is happy. But it, maybe it's, it's, a, it's actually it's a nice way to look at this as monotonicity, it's like a, like a bit simplifying, not all cases will be covered, but like uh, that's fine. <coughs> okay, basically let's move away from the plots. So basically, like here I wanted to say what I've already kind of tell you, like what, what, what's the connection of this to like the guarantees and the like optimization. So basically, if we are able to optimize their excess excess surrogate to up to accuracy h of epsilon, then we are guaranteed to have excess of the real loss below epsilon. Because actually, because this can be easily seen by contradiction because if this is not the case, if this one is like a difference between this and this is bigger than epsilon, then we have to be like bigger than the calibration function just because it's the minimum already computed. So basically that's again like the, the result of Zhang that like if this function is greater than zero everywhere rather than zero, then like uh, the surrogate is consistent. So basically then the next question, basically, that we posed, like when we like, uh, started looking at this. So uh, wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. uh, what is delta L? Delta L is the uh, difference between R L <coughs> and the optimal point and the point uh, F. So basically, delta small L yep. is the difference between the <coughs> the, the expected, like with respect to Q, uh -huh. real loss and the minimal possible real loss. Okay. Minimal. So that's like. Kind of, like we, we want to minimize this. Like if we like uh, that would be like the real. So the minimums are achieved in different points. In yes. Delta phi and delta l. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So basically, then the the, um, the question is like, what can go wrong if, if the situation is already consistent? So basically, is consistency all what we want, or we want something? Is it enough or not enough? If it, like because like for like usually. Like in all of this of theoretical works, when people get uh, prove that something is consistent, then it's done. Like it's it's happy. So like uh, solved problem solved. Uh, especially this appears to be kind of true. Like for bi like for binary classification, then it's okay for uh, multi multi class classification when the number of classes is not too big. But that's it's not enough for like structured prediction. So basically, what can go, what can easily happen, is that this calibration function is very small, like exponentially small. So basically, how this can happen, it's, it's just there, like a quantity which is like a inverse proportional to number of classes appears at the beginning, and usually it appears in all the like uh, existing calibration functions, and then like uh, it's like uh, this is so small, this is very small. And it implies that we, in practice we can never actually reach reasonable accuracy and bounds are useless. 
because uh, we can never reach very small accuracy because of two reasons. Like first, like a finite data set and then finite runtime. Like we cannot do like exponential data sets and exponential runtime. So basically, like uh, to, to, to proceed, basically to do something with this, we have to like uh, kind of like, like up until now, like we were very general, we were working with like any surrogates, but like for any surrogates, it's kind of impossible to compute this. So like what people usually end up doing with, just prove that this is greater than zero, so consistency. But because now, like we, the consistency is not enough, like we want to go look at the constants, we, can, we need to actually compute these quantities, and then doing that for like general um, surrogates is just not possible. I don't know how to do it, it's like too hard. So basically, like what we do and what people usually do, we go for all these squares. So basically, we, we, can do, we look at the quadratic objective, like the simplest possible objective one can have, and then try to get the complete picture like, like with that. So basically, all the, four, all the results I will present uh, next will be about uh, this like, quadratic surrogate. So basically, let's look what this surrogate looks like. So basically, it's just we are kind of regressing the loss. So basically, f is our scores, and we want to regress the negative loss with the L2 error. So we, like also like, like but we have... regress, why, uh, why is the plus but not minus? Because we are maximizing the score. So we want to have the score which has the, sm the, sm ah. the, sm the smallest possible loss. Which is minus L. Yeah, which is minus L. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so like we, we can add like constants there, but it doesn't really matter. So like uh, just like the... the this form of writing this minimizes the number of symbols like, uh, that we need to use. Okay, and so basically this is like one form like, of structure that we have is L. And, and another important assumption is that uh, we assume that a uh, modeling assumption that like, uh, we assume this form of factorization of F. So basically there is the capital F, which is like kind of design matrix. So it's like a fixed, it's like a, it's non, it's the part of the surrogate, it's not it, it, it don't optimize over s, over that, and then like there is theta, which are like real parameters which depend on x. So it, it, you can think of this as like factor some some factoriz some form of factorization assumptions. So basically, this matrix is typically very low rank, and it's like very tall matrix. So it's very long, like the number of rows corresponds to the number of labels, mm -hmm. and then like number of columns correspond to number of actual degrees of freedom. So we have way less degrees of freedom than than labels. So and so basically, only like combining structure here and structure here will allow us in the future to, to get away from this like exponential quantities in the calibration functions. Uh, what is this Gothic f? Is it the same as just usual f or not? Uh, because this is the function and this is like a, a, like a vector. Ah. A vector, so it's like a. Kind yeah, but you, you, like what I'm gonna do, I'm going to just plug this into this as a regular f, and then like uh, we'll we'll care about dependency on theta. Excuse me, what is k? And what k is k, k is number of classes. Uh, and you mean this exponential? Number yes, like k is the like k is exponential big number, and like which we should be like afraid of very much. What is l colon y? So that's the so l basically is a loss matrix, which is k by k like a huge matrix, and this is like one column of that matrix. So basically this, those are all the losses if the correct label is Y. I'm using like a MATLAB notation. Okay. So basically let's, like for that kind of surrogate, we are using this for a purpose, that for it we actually can compute some calibration functions. Which is like, I'm not, super, I'm not showing you any like proof techniques how to actually compute this. Like uh, I'm not super proud of this. I'm proud that those were possible, but like how this was done is like uh, I, I would prefer to improve this proof techniques a lot. Okay, so basically let's like as we start with, of course, with the simplest like loss, like a zero one loss. So like we let's see like what happens. So basically here the calibration functions will be like quadratic functions epsilon squared over four k, where k is like number of classes. So this is like exponentially small and like uh, kind of intractable. But th th this is uh, expectable because like zero one loss is in some sense like worst case like worst possible loss. So like uh, it's, like we have to like uh, there is no structure there. So we cannot exploit structure at all. 
basically, let's go to the next loss, which is like a block zero and loss. So here, let's say we have k classes, and s is the size of the, blo the blocks. So for example, we have like... Uh, can the blocks intersect? No. Mm -hmm. And so the blocks uh, from the full covering? Yes. Like also, like let's assume that the blocks are like of the same size like, for, for simplicity. It doesn't really like uh, these are functions I can drop, but like uh, it doesn't really matter. So basically, like like in this, this kind of loss, we will like I think this is like in some sense very structured. If there are a lot of labels and there are very few blocks, say like there are mil millions of labels, but those are like split in two blocks. So it's kind of like should be very similar to bi just binary classification. Because the, like, the real task would be to classify between blocks and not between labels. So basically, the, the less blocks you have, the more structure you have, in some sense. What is a block? Like, just subset of labels. Uh, what is block 0, 1, loss? Probably you should, you should repeat it again. I'm not ready to remain here. Okay, let's use the, this thing. So basically, here are ones. And here are zeros. So here are like like three blocks, and this is like a, a matrix of size k by k. So it's like the, the simplest uh, structured loss we were able to come up with uh, to start innovations. So basically, and like intuitively, when you, when you when you look at this, it seems that the real like, kind of like measure of complexity of this loss is number of blocks, not right. the number of labels. Right. So we don't really care like uh, what is the number of so labels. So effectively, it responds to the uh, multiple, multi label classification problem where the, the number of labels is the number of blocks. Yes. Yes, yeah, so basically, if, if anyone would solve like this uh, a problem with this matrix, uh, with this type of loss in practice, they would immediately merge the labels and just <coughs> use the number right. of blocks. Right. Yes. So, in some sense, this is like, this is what we, we, want, we want to see this being like super easy, like in our analysis. Yes. So, basically, and like now, like the very unsatisfying fact for me was that if you just compute the, the calibration function for the, this kind of loss, then you still get something very small. So basically, the, you, you win at most factor of two, which is like uh, not satisfying at all. Maybe you should restrict somehow uh, the family of, of phi? F. So yeah, that's exactly what, what, what we are going to do next. So, so basically, here like the point is that just having the structured loss is not enough. So basically, even like for the simplest structured loss you can think of, like analysis doesn't react on that. Yeah, but you need a different kind of surrogate functions, I believe. Mm, yes, yeah, so basically we get, what we are going to do next, we are going to put more constraints on f. Mm -hmm. So f is like in some sense part of the surrogate, of the surrogate loss. So we, we are going to do that. We are going to like uh, use more specialized... Okay. Use more specialized surrogate. So basically, uh, that's exactly what's missing. So basically, if we add constraints on the scores, such that we, we require that the scores live in the span of the loss matrix, so basically scores within the, the blocks are equal always, so we get exactly what we want. So we go, like, uh, the calibration function becomes uh, O of uh, 1 over D, so where D is the number of blocks, which is like an effective measure of the complexity. So again, to achieve this, uh, you need to ensure what? To ensure that our, basically this set is defined <coughs> as a subspace, and this subspace is a span of all the columns of the loss matrix. So, so basically, linear combinations of the, the loss. So of course, and like, the, loss is, is the loss is this. So here it will be it will essentially be that all the components within the block are equal because you can never dis like, uh, make a difference between them. But doesn't this mean that uh, the problem becomes exactly equivalent to this uh, delayable classification? Mm. The machine, the yes, all uh, these, uh, yes and no, it's kind of equivalent, but the objective is slightly different. So basically, like, like for, for us, this was mostly like a test that it should pass. So if this doesn't work, then like what, what do we hope for for the more complicated losses? Okay. <laughs> so it's you can look at this as a, like a test, like yeah. a sanity check. It so works. Check. So we, we get this. I'm not suggesting to use this for real like applications, like for, for this kind of loss. 
Okay, so basically then that we were able also to derive everything for Hamming loss, which is more complicated. And actually like here like the story is the same. So basically if there are no constraints on this course, then we get something like very small. So it's not exactly this, it's like a slightly more complicated function. So basically like here it's exactly that like a step functions with step that I showed you at the beginning. It's like from here. It's like a kind of a nasty function to derive. Uh, but if we add constraints on this course, here like constraints obviously are, are that uh, the scores are separable, so their score can be represented as a sum of little scores which correspond to individual variables, kind of, a, kind of en energy, energy style factorization. Mm, with the factors of, 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 of what size? With just human factors? Yeah, just human factors. So that Again, this is not too interesting. Well, there's no structure in this score, right? Mm, no, the, the, this is structure. So basically, the, the, and the, this actually like makes a lot of sense. Why? Because if you have a Hamming loss, then what, what, like, uh, what you want to like, if you had access to like complete probability, what you would do, you would just compute the marginals and take the maximum of marginals. Mm -hmm. So basically, if all the like this is like uh, suggests us to do like exactly that, we just derive individual functions for these marginals and just. Did, just do that. What is T? T is the... So, so basically, like uh, for Hamming loss, we, to define Hamming loss, we have to like, kind of define variables, like, uh, like kind of a set, a sequ sequence of variables, like sequence is not really there, and like a set of variables, <coughs> or T variables. So basically T equals the, the log of K. So basically 2 to the power of T equals K. So basically we have like t binary variables and the number of all possible configurations is uh, 2 to t, which is k. So that's why like, like this, this t is much, much smaller than... Can we say that this is uh, also the, the, the number of unit terms in our... Yeah, energy. yeah, that's that. That's that. Exactly. And, and, and again, it's essential condition that um, our score function cannot contain, say, pairwise terms or high value terms. Well, okay. So basically, that's what like we get now. So basically, like th these quantities are like exact quantities. So basically, if if we change, so basically, these quantities depend on the surrogate, on the loss, and on the like family, like on the constraints, on the family of the of scores. So basically, if we change on any of this, like this can this can go this can change. So especially if, if we are adding. Like, <coughs> Like kind of more relaxed factorization, then we are kind of increasing like subset of scores, subspace of scores, and then these functions can only go smaller, which which is like not what we want. Basically, next uh, next step is like the, our like most positive results. So basically, I'm not expecting you like to, like to parse this theorem uh, in details, but like uh, I'll tell you just what it means. So basically, we have a lower bound on the calibration functions, which is which applies only to, like, to consistency case that, cases that are consistent. So basically, like family of the scores are like big enough. So basically, with, by big enough, it means that they contain the span of the loss matrix. They cannot be smaller. It's basically, that. And then, like for any f, like like this kind of quantity appears. So it's a projection operator of the vectors which contain all zeros except two positions. One position is one, and another position is minus one. And we kind of project pro project these vectors on the subspace of scores, and then we like we, we measure those. So basically, and this appears to be like the lower bound. So and the lower bound of this, like this, this quantities can be upper bounded by two. So the, this is the, the, the this function as was the the, the calibration function for the zero one loss is the lower bound like on like anything. And you say that it is an optimistic bound. Yes, be, be, because like <laughs> okay, because like this the, actually like this quantity can be like very small, or not very small, like very large in the end, in some sense. So basically, for example, like uh, what are the properties of this bound? If you compute this bound for Hamming loss for block zero and loss, they match a, 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 the exact values. So it's just exact. But for Hamming loss, we have the epsilon squared divided by t. Yes. So basically, like here we will have. Uh, like this quantity will equal to 
k divided by t, so k will like cancel out and like uh, just we will, we will get like with the up to up to some constants we get uh -huh. we, we we get what we want. So in some sense, this this bound like for the uh, losses that we can compute exactly, this bound gives the like good values. <laughs> and also, what does this bound suggest? So basically, it suggests that of course like uh, this subspace of scores the, the the smaller it is, the better. Then uh, it, it says that, but but like uh, just being low, low low rank is not enough. So like one of like when we were like searching for like something like this, like one natural assumption was that just take something low rank and it will be fine. But being low rank is not enough. Like even for like the loss like of the smallest possible rank, you can always like, get bad directions and it will like uh, just destroy calibration function. So basically, it has to be low rank and aligned. Basically, not aligned with specific directions in the space, so that projections are small. So basically, again, like uh, all I can say about this result is that it it it's, it works for block zero and loss. It works for Hamming loss. Of course, like it works for for regular you mean zero the, loss. The bound is tight. Yeah, the bound is the bound is tight. Mm -hmm. And all like uh, this bound, like when. If we try to apply the same bound for non-consistent case, we just get zeros, so like a uh, like useless bound. So it does, doesn't say anything useful. So, so basically, like, like one interesting direction for the future would be like more, like more precisely characterize this. What happens to this when we, get, when we try to change the subspace? So, so basically, when we are adding, starting to add directions, like if all, all all we know for now is that this, this bound is not going to go up, it's like going down, like the, the bad direction. But like uh, how fast will it go, uh, it's not clear. Yes? What is delta i? Delta i is basically a vector with uh, all zeros and one, one in position i. Like, uh, okay. <coughs> yeah. What is the physical sense of this df times delta ij? Yeah, so that's that's yeah. this projection of this like direction on the subspace of scores. So basically, it's kind of you are searching in which direction you can make the biggest kind of error. You mean how the the, the score will change? You will switch from i label to j label. If you mm, yes, if you move in that direction. So basically, if you start moving in the, in, in in that direction, what will be Oh, but we're in a discrete space. We can't just start moving in that direction. We yeah, but like, switch in, like in terms of scores, in terms of and the scores are the, the scores are variables. Yeah, but the scores are con course, uh, continuous, so we can we can move in the space of scores. That's and cool. so basically, if we start to moving scores in this direction, like in in some sense, we we are moving the excess of the real loss. Ah, so in, uh, with some constants. This simply mean. means that. Um, uh, the scope cannot change too much if we switch just one, one, one label. No. No, no. In some sense, we can switch labels in the sense that, like, our vector of scores defines which label we predict. Yes. So basically, because we pick the maximum, right. the, the maximum value. So basically, yes. If we, if we switch the two or like move in the direction to switch the two, like, what will be the difference in the in the surrogate? And so basically, if the difference in the surrogate is uh, is big, then like we get like this quantity gets big, and then like the bound is, is, is big, and then we are happy. No, vice versa. If it is big, then this minimum is. Uh, uh, no, I mean like uh, the whole thing. Okay, yes, yeah. this this have to be small. Yes. So like, this like things in the denominator have to be small. No. Big. Oh, in denominator, small. yeah, the, yeah, the denominator small. has to be small. Then the whole thing is big, and yes, then the bound is true. big. So we want this to be like as big as possible. And this big sounds very possible. reasonable. Yeah. So now the question is, uh, why the small case of a uh, uh, Hamming loss, for example? What is the intuition? <laughs> what do you mean, like the, the intuition? It's exactly that. So basically, we. But why? Why? Yeah, because in, in, in some sense with this losses, like the, the subspace, the, the, the subspace in this like high dimensional space is equally distant from all their 
all these directions, all, all, all the delta ij, so it's like somewhat in the middle, and it's like far from them. And that's why, like, I, like I'm sorry, I don't really have like more intuition. I can only say that projections are small, but like it's uh, it's repeating the same thing. I have a feeling that it should have a very clear physical interpretation. Physical Possible. Interpretation. Maybe, maybe. But like, in, in some sense, like, if the loss is low rank and somewhat symmetric, so basically kind of all the all these quantities are like equal, then like we have hope that the bound will be will work well. And if there are like some bad directions which are aligned well with uh, with with one of the deltas, then like uh, it won't really work. Okay. Two commands of what well, we're talking about directions. There are no directions. F is simply a vector. Yes, but like the delta ij is a vector, it's like some direction. So we are projecting this directions on, on the subspace of scores, like those vectors on subspace of scores. Yes? Can you explain why, why they should be small? Okay. Why you want this, like, a, so basically, well, why like for, in the very beginning? I mean the projection of the... Yeah, okay, so we want this bound to be big. We want calibration function to be big, yes? I understand this, but I okay. don't understand why, uh, in the good case, uh, these projections are small. Because I think I don't understand what 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 is this, what these projections are. Okay, then this goes deep. So basically, I don't have. Uh, so basically, I can explain connection between. Why, why, why we want this to be small, but why they are small in the good case, that goes into the proof. So that, like, I don't have extra geometric intuition for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what is, the pre what is this? <laughs> well, there, there is, like, a sub subspace of scores, and then there are, like, very, like, uh, specific directions. Subspace of scores, you need, like, a vector of uh, length k? Uh, yes, like, uh, like all the scores, scores are like vectors of length k. But From then some subspace. They, they no, live in some subspace, vectors. yes. Yeah, okay. And, and then like there, there are certain directions, certain vectors in certain directions that we project on the on this subspace, and we want those to be projections to be small. Because if the subspace is aligned well with some of those, so like, like the projection is big, then like small change of scores there leads to big change in their in the in the in the surrogate. In, in the excess surrogate, and then like uh, this is small. Yes. Okay. Uh, is, is it right that uh, they don't uh, they don't have to be um, small all of them, but only yeah, like one, one, at least one one of them, yes. which is very small. Yes. That's the that's the consequences of the fact that we are doing like worst case analysis. So basically, one bad direction is enough to kill the calibration function. So it's like that's the property of this analysis. It's always like something like that will appear. One but ship spoils the whole right? Yes. Uh, okay. Exactly. Okay, but like to, in, in the defense of this analysis, like, I have to say that in <coughs> most like realistic losses are somewhat symmetric. So basically they run like, like for example, the ranking losses are like, will be like somewhat symmetric. So there will be no like very like uh, specified direction. So it's kind of, uh, there, there, there are some symmetries and the more symmetries they are, then the then the, the less that matters that there are like some specific directions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, as I, as I said, this bound suggests that like the good losses will be like low rank, and then like they should be not only low rank but like aligned in a specific way, like uh, in the subspace. Okay. So basically, now, like. Uh, Let's assume that like we are done. So basically, I've I've told you like all I know about calibration functions. So like I have like this bound which I consider as like very like optimistic results. And I have like a bunch of other like pessimistic results. But like uh, let's say like we, we can compute the calibration functions. So basically, is this like uh, the end? Is it like are we happy? So obviously no, because like uh, I've kind of cheated you a bit. So like I've defined the scale of calibration function like arbitrarily. And it's it's like I multiply my surrogate by a constant, like any constant, any positive constant, <coughs> and then my calibration function is multiplied by the same constant, and then like uh, all this like kind of scale, the notion of scale is not defined. Mm -hmm. So basically, I, I've put one over k there, and it's like kind of my choice of like what is like a natural scale, but it's not like uh, it's not. So I could have put 
one there, and then like uh, there will be no notion of one over k. So basically, the next step is to actually like try to define the scale. Like what is the scale? Like how to get the scale right? So basically, and uh, the approach we took to do this is to connect to actual optimization convergence rates. But because like when we like ch when we start changing the scales, all the constants that appear in, in the convergence rates change. Not all, but some of them change. And then like we need to have like a compromise between all these things. So basically, we want to have the like, calibration functions in the, in, the, in the right spot, and like all these constants, not to kill the rate. So basically, you have to be like uh, very careful to present the, the to get the, the final result. So basically, what we are going to do is to actually like take in, like the simplest algorithm I know, like uh, like for which would be like uh, average SGD, like to to minimize this function, like in like online way, and then try to apply the, the rate there. So basically, like here, like, like, like to do that, to start doing that, we have to assume the exact function space. So here, let, let's assume that function space is of course linear, so like the, the simplest possible thing. In the, but like, uh, it, it doesn't have to be finite dimensional, so basically in the paper it's written all with kernels, so in the end of the day it can be like a universal kernel, and because the analysis of this particular algorithm, of this particular optimization algorithm is dimension free, so it, it goes directly to the kernel cases. So it's just uh, can be applied there. So basically, what will be like our function space in the end of the day? It's, it will be this. So basically, we have this like design matrix F. We have some uh, feature map which, which goes to from input to a vector of dimension d, like which is like our features. And then there is like a w, which is a parameter matrix. Then we actually want to. That's what we want to optimize with respect to. We want to learn to get w. So in in case of uh, infinite dimensions, it will be like uh, one dimension of this will be infinite, so it will be like several vectors in the uh, RKHS reproducing kernel Hilbert space, but I'm not going to like go there, so that's like uh, a state finite dimensional, like for simplicity. Okay, so basically, like with this, for, for this thing, like it's kind of easy to compute the stochastic gradient, so it's just like explicit form, because everything is quadratic, we just like uh, derive it with respect to W and set to zero, and then we have the, the gradient. Yeah, sorry, there is a plus here, but that's my, my type. <coughs> okay, so basically now we just, like after like Helen said that, we just need to take a suitable like algorithm with convergence rate and like just plug it there, like combine the rates and get the constants. But like uh, it's not really so basically like what is the what will be the algorithm like the we are going to use it will be like projected average SGD with constant step size so basically it's algorithm with finite horizon so basically you just tell me like like we have n like how many steps we are going to make and then like you choose step size according to like which depends on like all the constants and n then we do like n steps mm, like that and then there, there will be like we will we'll have the rate. So, so basically, like, what are the constants? Like, okay, one constant bounds the distance to the optimum, so that's the ball on which we are projecting, and then there is the constant that bounds the expectation of the squared norm of the gradient. And n is what? And n is number, big n. Big n is number of steps. What is pd? P is projection on the ball of radius or diameter d. Well, the ball sounds where? where? Uh, the, in, in terms of parameters, so basically we have parameters, matrix of parameters, uh -huh. we have that space, then we, the, I think it's all with respect to Frobenius norms like in terms of matrices, kind of L2 norm if we vectorize everything, mm -hmm. and, and then like, there, there is a ball there of diameter D. With center at zero? Yeah, center at zero, and then we project. That, that's the algorithm. So basically, like this, this projection is a substitute for regularization. So instead of having like L2 regularization okay, with okay. lambda parameter, we project like to control the norm. So basically, then there is like old results. So in, in the paper we cite like paper of 2006 or 2008, but like result goes like back like very old. It's like I was not able to trace the exact reference, but like uh, the, there is a rate. So the, the people like Nimirovsky, Nesterov, Polyak, and so on, they, they they've known this like. For ages. So basically, the rate is not uh, the rate is like one over square root n, and like this, like two constants in the enumerator d and n. And also, like what, what this rate is, so basically, it's expectation on the surrogate risk at the at the averaged position, at the averaged position. 
we will have our iterators, we average them, and then we compute, uh, take an expectation in respect to everything. And we get this. So basically now, like, to, like, we need to combine this with the calibration functions and like, uh, get everything. So we, basically, and here is like, the nastiest part of the old theory, that we, we have to have like, extra assumptions. Like, uh, like, uh, nothing can be done without extra, some extra assumptions. So basically, what we need to assume is that optimization is well specified. Basically, what does this mean? I've even put that like, in the red box like, to emphasize. So basically, it means that there exists a global minimum of this with respect to all measurable functions f that belongs to our function class. So, and that's like without that, the like, calibration business doesn't work. So basically, like with the finite dimensions, this sounds like a, like a very strong assumption. We actually assume that the data is generated by the model, essentially that. So basically, if we go to universal kernels, it can be it's, it's, it's sounds much better because like universal kernel can approximate anything. So basically, then like uh, we are happy. But also, it's, it's not that easy because then uh, the norm of the optimum stops being bounded, and then it's like we have to be like super careful with the optimization. Yes. What is psi psi of x? Psi of x is the feature map. And uh, why do you say that f should be measurable? Uh, doesn't it follow from the uh, from that representation? Yes, but look, basically this, this, this is my assumptions that like so set of measurable fun all measurable functions is a very like big set. So maybe not, I forgot all measurable functions, but like that like, can be like this f is there, so this f is taken care of explicitly. So like we don't care about f. So the problem <coughs> is like the minim minimum of that with respect to all measurable functions, have to be of this space. Otherwise, like, uh, results stop working. Like, uh, stuff breaks. So basically, this, like, in finite dimensions, th this looks, like, very nasty. So basically, when we go to infinite dimensions with universal kernels, like, when we, we can approximate any function, it starts looking a bit better. But uh, still, like, then there are problems with optimization, and, like, uh, kind of, like, that result that I'm going to use, the simple result, doesn't work anymore. So, like, uh, it's uh, something more powerful have to be used. And anyway, like I'm not going to go there. Uh, I just don't know those results. Don't don't understand. So once again, what do you mean by being very careful with optimization? Okay, so basically, let's say we have a universal kernel, so we can approximate any function. But then, like when we when we are going to approximate that function, like some um, true function that we don't know, when we are going to build the sequence to that converges to it, the norm of this sequence will be unbounded. Normal, the elements will, go, will grow unbounded, mm -hmm. and optimization, like in that situation, is hard. It's just like standard results don't apply. For example, like this result, it has d, d, and then d is infinite, and then bound result doesn't work. So like there, there, there exists results that like specifically target this situation. Like Francis does stuff like that with some of his students, like to like uh, kind of derive results. But anyway, then like. What, what always happens is that like these assumptions are substituted with other assumptions which are less interpretable <coughs> and like just uh, it, it's super hard to trace and also like the, each step you go in these directions uh, rates becomes more complicated so there are like way more symbols and way more constants and since like here like the goal is to compute constants if there are like ten of them it's, it's harder compared to when there are two of them so basically like we, we like what we've done we've just taken this assumption especially given that all the other papers like, which are somewhat similar do that do the same. But actually, like, well, that's uh, like a big drawback, big problem of the analysis. Yeah, but okay. So basically, now, like, let's like, given the having said that, that we have this assumption, let's actually like uh, compute the constants and like get to the rate, see see what we get. So basically, if we just like after that we we, we combine the rate with the calibration functions, basically we invert the rate, and then we can get this. This statement. So basically, to, to reach accuracy of epsilon on the true expected mm, on, on the ex expected risk on the expected actual population risk, we need like this number of iterations. So basically, what what does this quantity depend on? It depends on d and m, like these quantities that were there, like in the convergence rate and calibration function. So basically. That's the that kind of result that I prom promised you in the beginning. So the, the actual guarantee on the on the test error. So calibration function 
raise this as epsilon squared, yeah? In, mm, in simple yeah. cases. Yes. So it, and it is squared once again. So it is 1 over epsilon in the fourth degree. So it's too, too big number, this t. Yes, but like here, I don't care that much about the dependency of epsilon. So I, I, care, I care more about constants. So basically, if there is k, so basically if like this is like 1 over k, then like this thing will be like a k squared, and that's like a, that's the end. Uh -huh. So I, I, like, for example, like what we can do if we try to make the the, the objective strongly convex, then we can get algorithms with like one over n, like convergence rate. It, it will be better, but like. Uh, so a couple of millions does not matter here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it depends like what epsilon you want. If you want point one, that sounds sounds okay. If you, if you want just point one. Yeah, but like here, so, so basically, like, uh, I'm not developing new optimization techniques, I'm just the user, so I'm happy to use whatever I have. So like, uh, I was able to parse only the simplest one, so like, uh, that's what I'm using. So basically, if there is like, a better, better optimization algorithm, which do exist, like, uh, the people are working on this like, every day, so basically like, uh, it can be like, used here to get better rates. But I, like, what, what I'm going to do now is to actually like, once again, like look at this constants because like this one we've already like looked at. So basically, for zero and loss it's bad, and for like block zero and loss and, and hanging loss it's good if the f is chosen in, in the proper way. So now what I'm going to do is to just compute this like the, the remaining constants to get the actually like the, the final result. To and I'll compute those for well, for the free losses I'm considering. So basically, what constants do we need to compute? It's the Upper bound from the distance to the optimum, like to be able to project on the run, uh, to project on the right ball, and also like uh, bound on the gradients. So basically, I'm not going to show these things individually. Just, uh, just like the the, ba the bound for on the in the product because the product that's what appears in the ring. So basically, like this thing depends again on like many constants. So, but uh, the, this is. Uh, we can we can set basically take D and M such that the product is like that. But what what are these constants? Like what what is here? So basically there are like two constants that we kind of have control of when we choose our surrogate. So one is the condition number of the like the matrix F. So if, if like but by doing this we can so basically intuitively if this matrix is badly conditioned then optimization is hard and like everything is slow. And if it's well conditioned, it's better. So it, it appears exactly in this way, this way in the rate. And another quantity is the rank. So basically, rank of f. The smaller rank, the better. So, so that's this. And then there are like two, two more quantities which you don't have control of. So those are like quantities which depend on the data. So like first one is the upper bound on the norm of the of the feature maps. It always appears in the results like that. And the, the second one is the upper bound on the sum of the marginal probabilities as function of, as like functions of features. So since we assume that the problem is well specified, then this upper bound is there. So something. So in some sense, it's generalization of the equality that sum over Q is less or equal than one. So basically, like after doing this, let's finally compute. And what is L max? Uh, L max is the maximum value of the losses. It's one. So it's, uh, it's the. Uh, yeah. It's a small number. Yeah, it's a small number. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the easiest one. L max is easy to deal with. Just thermalize. Okay, so basically, what, what are the values? So basically, this is the. Like for zero and loss, it's like, oh, oh okay, I, I haven't even like, uh, put the. Uh, I know the exact quantity, but it's, like, uh, it's kind of ugly putting all this together. But it's big, so but like uh, they are not surprised. So basically, zero and loss is hard, and we are screwed in all the ways, all the pla possible places. Everything is bad. So at this place, it has to be like a drum. So basically, that's the like the key moment <laughs> what's going to happen for the actual the good losses. And bam, it's actually good. So basically, we actually have the that this product is O big O of B, where B is like number of blocks. So it's it's a good one. So it's small. And for hanging loss, we have this, which is not quite 
the number of their of length, but not not of number of variables, number of, of variables cube, but but still, it's like a, it's, it's it's not exponential mm -hmm. for no now. Okay, so that's basically it. That's the content. Yes, that's the, that's the end of the of the story. So we we, we got the like complete bound, and it's not it's not exponential for like the two like simple losses. I still don't understand one, one thing, maybe a stupid question. Mm -hmm. uh, you have condition number here of matrix F and you have a rank yes. matrix F. If F is, is uh, degenerate, I mean uh, it contains zero single values, then its conditioning number will be what? Will it pass Yes. Yeah, okay. we, 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 we will remove this like uh, directions. <laughs> It's like, okay, so F is a part of the surrogate, so it doesn't really depend on the data. So we, we are like a, the people who, mo who model the thing, like select F. So please don't add the generate directions. <laughs> I think that probably this could be like, there should be like a look around on this. So like, we, we should be, there should be, the, we will just consider the ratio to the smallest non-zero singular value. This probably could be like worked out, but uh, I haven't done that. So just please don't add. <laughs> Yeah, but this means that k over cap over uh, probably some well, alternative, but not exactly conditioning number, right? Well, I like, assume uh, that uh, uh, f, f is of rank r, so there are no degenerate columns, and then it's condition number. So it's just uh, r. R is, is rank of what? Of f. Of f. So basically, f is r r times k, so k and okay. r. So it's the it's the rank. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the rank. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But, uh, like for for this particular thing, I'm not worried too much. Uh, I think this can be like easily worked out. It will just like add complexity, not at the key place. Okay. So basically, that's the the whole story. Let me like quickly conclude. So basically, the whole like point of doing this was to like present like kind of a theoretical approach to like trying to choose a surrogate to understand what what is a good surrogate and like to get some way other than pure <coughs> empirical studies to like uh, to, to get get a surrogate. Then also like uh, we discovered that for structured prediction consistency is not enough. So consistency is a good property, but like it's not enough. And maybe like we've seen examples like I've shown you like at one of the plots. So it can be that uh, if the loss if the surrogate is not consistent, it can still allow you to achieve certain accuracy. Not arbitrarily small accuracy, but certain good, maybe good accuracy, but like a much faster. So it might be worth considering even non-consistent loss. But like for, for that case, I don't have any like smart theoretical result to show you. Anton, uh, yes. again, one secret question. And at what part of the talk uh, you were selecting the surrogate? Uh, the, the quadratic surrogate. But you have fixed it. Like the F, the matrix F is also like design matrix. But matrix F is. Uh, it defines the, the, the score function, right? Yes, so it's not the surrogate. It's the score function. Yeah, the okay. score function is different from surrogate. So you were yes. analyzing the score function, yeah. but uh, you were not analyzing the, the, the surrogate. The surrogate was always fixed. Yeah, okay, we, I agree. You can look at this way. It's only like for quadratic surrogate because you couldn't prove anything else. <laughs> so, yes. It's. Uh, it's very interesting direction to, to go for, like trying to do something else, but uh, I, I'm afraid with my current proof techniques, it, it, it's not easy, <laughs> so something has to be changed there. Maybe we should have to go from high school math to like, uh, like uh, undergrad level math, like there, like use something smarter compared to what I used. So, and it wasn't just high school math? Yes, like, actually like those, like the hardest results, the like, exact computation of this thing, are like high school math. So there is nothing there like, just not able to like uh, use any like uh, knowledge I get, just like direct computation. <laughs> okay. So anyway, like uh, like we've shown that like calibration functions can be computed sometimes. So it's not hopeless to try to compute them. Maybe sometimes like we can we can get like even relatively general bounds. Well, not as general as we would want to, but like relatively general, and it's still. I think it's still interesting. And then like. Uh, we try to like define the scale of the surrogate by connecting to the optimization. This piece I, I've never seen before. So because usually people don't divide by k and then they're happy, but when k goes 
but then like the the surrogate they're optimizing like the values are like exponentially big so it's uh, it's hard so basically maybe like, like this like way to just use optimization algorithm as a like scaling factor and like uh, to get the right constants the right scaling is like an uh, interesting way can maybe, I think this idea can be like applied some, somewhere else and also like like in all of that we have like we had to be like super careful with constants because like uh, exponential quantities pop up here and there, and then then they can kill any any rate. And so basically, like uh, future plans is to like try to bound calibration functions and constants for more losses. So here, like we, we do have for some which idea. one, for example. <laughs> yeah, like uh, like. Uh, What's the idea? Logistic, <laughs> like <there's> something <laughs> like logistic. So basically, I, so I, that I, you can't calculate anything for logistic. Well, maybe we can could bound something like uh, well, it's like. Uh, ah, we just Jack or Jordan bound the logistic with quadratic and <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe, maybe, the maybe that's, that's the way that's the way. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah okay. Like so, basically, like since now we know everything, almost everything about quadratic, we can like uh, if we can bound something with quadratic, like we, we are did, uh, happy. Yeah, but like it's future work. Uh, so basically, like try to generalize analysis for other surrogates, maybe. This mostly applies to optimization part because that was also done like only for the quadratic. So maybe there is like a more principal way to compute this this uh, this constants and not, not not to have because like computing this constants for each circuit is kind of annoying and so basically like maybe some more general bound or like specific optimization algorithm which is good as, as a scaling factor like with easy constants that that will be good. <laughs> And also, like the final point is to try to make this practical. <laughs> like in my defense, like to make it about practice, pra practice, I can say that <coughs> there is a research direction which is like very related to this and it's kind of practical. So, so basically, it's called like input-output kernel ridge regression. Like uh, this, like uh, it's the whole like set of methods. So basically, what they do, they have uh, like uh, an objective. Which does not depend on the loss, but which matches like feature maps of uh, outputs and inputs in the like in the RKHS. So basically, and then w when they get their like estimator for that, they apply the loss and do like uh, solve the inference problem. So and so basically, if we uh, consider a finite data set instead of doing SGD and like consider like just a finite data set and then solve the regular way, you, you go the, the regular way with kernels like uh, compute gram matrix and other stuff. Then we get exactly the same estimator as they do. So it's like a, like this quadratic estimator with kernels. Their approach kind of works. So like uh, in that case, ours should also work. This will be like the same estimator. The difference is that they are the all the like regret bounds they have are like exponentially small. They just like uh, put like some norm in the in the bound and don't ever uh, analyze how, how big or small that is. So the infrastructure prediction that doesn't really work. So basically, like another point, but it's it's not also if that that was that simple, I would have already done this. But like it's not like that because if we go away from like uh, online SGD, then we have to apply learning theory and like get sample complexity bounds, and that's not easy. That's 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 another layer of complication which I couldn't get through right like, now. So above high level, uh, high school math. Yeah, like that's that's. Uh, you know, like when I see like actual Hilbert faces, it's it's uh, it's complicated. Okay, so basically that's it. Thanks a lot. Okay, any questions? <laughs> any questions? <laughs> so, yes. uh, so, what is the problem with uh, calibration functions to be exponentially small? Is it practical? With reasons like you can run SGD because yeah, so, so basically, what, what is calibration function? It, it, it's, it, it tells you like which accuracy you need on the optimization problem you are actually solving to get the correct accuracy on the optimization problem you actually want. So it connects like the two. So if it's exponentially small, it means that like for a reasonable accuracy like that you request, you have to solve the optimization problem exponentially well. And then, like your convergence rate will blow up. You, you will just not be able to achieve that accuracy. Especially when you're dealing with SGD. <laughs> yeah, especially SGD, and like you have finite samples, so it's it's, it's like like whatever they've seen, whatever they've somewhat shown that like 
complexity of calibration function is like somewhat correlated with complexity of constants in optimization. So uh, for if the loss is hard, like everything breaks. So like for zero loss, like like nothing works. But like it's kind of meaningful if you have like say like ten to twenty three classes, then like optimizing like exact class is uh, maybe not a good idea to do that. It's like kind of intuitive, intuitive on its own. It's basically our like byproduct of what we've done is like one way to like formalize that intuition. Um, yes. How do you do inference for a quadratic surrogate? Okay, that, that's a very good question. So basically, like, uh, I've put that under the carpet, but like, uh, it's, I'm happy to explain this piece. So basically, yeah, I just I'm open the gradient I need to show the gradient. So basically, to actually implement this, there are like two, like several like tricky pieces. First, like, like some of these metrics are like uh, have k in the dimensionality, so it has to be like multiplication has to be done. The, the good news is that k is in the right place, it's like inside. So we, like, to, basically, to be able to implement this, we have to be able to compute f transpose f, where like k is inside, and we have to be able to compute f transpose l, like this thing, where like also like dimension k is inside. Like for all the losses I've used, those are analytic, so it's like easy to just compute. Mm -hmm. But like if, if the losses are more complicated, like uh, some inference algorithm can be there. But like this thing has to be computed once, it's just like, just there. And this thing, it does not depend on x, it does not depend on data, it's like uh, it only depends on the label. So it's also like uh, somewhat kind of e e easy, maybe easier inference algorithm. So, mm -hmm. but, but anyway, like those have to, this has to, to, to apply to implement this gradient, compute this, this stochastic gradient, those have to be computed. Then the next piece is the actual inference. So what is the actual inference? The actual inference will be, so basically we need to compute max with respect to y of f w phi x. So basically here again, like this will be like, uh, say like we have x, then like if we are not using kernels, we're just computing this explicitly, like those are like small matrices. If, if we are like using kernels, this will be like uh, inside a kernel, regular like kernel expressions with matrix, but like with the uh, regular kernel expressions, yes. But like still, like we will have to optimize in the end f times something. And like to do this maximum, yes, we will have to use the structure of f. So basically, a structure of f somehow, for example, if it gives you like factorization assumptions, then we can do like regular inference algorithms. So and uh, if if uh, nothing is there, then sorry. Thank you. And what about the situation when we uh, can find maximum approximately? Well, then, like uh, it's like as usual, if you have control on how, how approximate you are, then you can like combine this with the bounds and get like a result which deals, which controls for this approximation. Mm -hmm. If you have no guarantees, then like no guarantees. Yeah, but uh, if, if you, that's like, the usual case. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Like like th this analysis is, has like many stages, and if at one stage you lose connection, then <laughs> you cannot say anything anymore. <laughs> you, there is no. No guarantees. So any questions? If not, then let us pick the speaker again.